Okay, there we go. Action. <laughs> Action. <laughs> oh, that's fine. I've got you. Yeah. Um, perhaps just uh, um, could you reflect for us on like when you started facilitating the work, and uh, what inspired you then, and what inspires you now, um, touring with with Joanna. What inspires me was. Um, my first depth experience of the work that we connect, or it was called Deep Ecology then, was back in about 1988. And while I'd been to a shorter workshop a few years before, this was a, a long, it was a long weekend, so it was like a weekend plus a day. And I was in my 20s back then, 26 or something, and um, that I was asked what I grieve for in our world. And I just remembered, some years before, I'd, I'd spent some time working in Sri Lanka at a centre for abandoned, malnourished children, and I had held this starving child, this two-year-old child, in my hands and helped feed it. And it was just the memory of this child with these matchstick arms and legs and the kind of... I, I don't know, it just felt like I was holding a victim of a crime. And the there is just such a huge torment of like one in seven of our world's population who don't have enough to eat and I just felt this immense grief you know what am I asked what I was asked what, what, what do I grieve for in our world and I was asked just to express what I grieve for and I just had this flood of sadness about children dying because they don't have enough food to eat and um, it kind of shocks me, but it felt like it was the sadness that was linked to something that I'd experienced four years ago of seeing children starving that I hadn't really felt much at the time. It like it got lodged inside me somewhere. And this process, it was called a cairn of mourning where we drew something or had something to represent what it was we mourned for and then we added it to a pile in the center and we spoke to our, our grief, spoke about from our grief. Um, and I cried for hours. I, I just went to my bed afterwards, and it was th that was just one part of the workshop. And then it also looked at how we find our courage, determination, um, strength to respond to respond to what it is that aches our heart. And it sounds strange, like you go away for a weekend and you get in touch with this mass of grief. But I came away afterwards, feelings completely energised, like really charged up and also deepened in my determination to do something about the crime of mass, huge scale starvation and that's just one of so many other issues that yeah. brings people to workshops like this but that was something that I was just really feeling strongly at the time and still do and, and I just thought, well that was just a weekend you know, that was a weekend and somehow it switched something on in me that I'd been an activist before, been concerned, been involved, but in a way that felt somehow a bit dissociated. You know, I was kind of going through the motions, doing what I felt was right, but I, I just felt this strong sense of deepened determination and resolve. And I felt I found my work. I thought this is so important that this is the work I want to do. And so at that point, I began a journey. I began a journey of training myself. I, I got really interested in group work and started going on courses in group work and ended up getting a job being involved in working with groups. Um, and also, the, the year after that event, there was a week with Joanna Macy in Scotland that I went to. And that was a another on a series of life-changing events and I basically I signed up you know I signed up as I'm this is what I want to do and I apprenticed myself to Pat Fleming who co-wrote Thinking Like a Mountain with Joanna Macy, Arnie Ness and John Seed um, and I began as the cook I, I was the cook stroke publicity leaflet person and just extra helping hands and then from there doing more of the work I got more involved and becoming a assistant facilitator, co-facilitator. I kind of worked my way in over, you know, a number of years. And when I first started running the workshop, I had Joanna's book, Despair and Personal Power in the Nuclear Age, open in front of me. 
and there's just these two exercises, the milling and open sentences, and I read it out of the book. It was just a short two-hour workshop, and it was very powerful. And so that's how I began. Mm. And uh, what do you feel um, have the, the, the people that you meet who come to your workshops um, uh, over the years, um, have there been uh, have they been sort of different kinds of people or different kinds of concerns? What have you observed over the time that you've been facilitating the work that reconnects? I think the main thing that I've witnessed is a deepening of the dread as to where we're heading. That when I started back in the late 1980s, climate change was talked of as something that we're heading towards if we don't do something about it. What we have now is, I mean I just remember Sir David King who's the government's chief scientist in the UK, he said the first cities to go from climate change will be New York, New Orleans and London and you know that was in 2004 he said that and the next year you had Hurricane Katrina and um, the, um, then we've had um, the flooding of New York as well with Hurricane Sandy and so like two of those three cities have already been hit by storm surge from unusually powerful hurricanes and there's also just a massive escalation in um, extreme weather events generally but also wildfires you know the fires that we've seen in Australia the fires that are um, happening in, in, in the States um, that's climate change consequences are something that are happening in our time and that's only with a relatively small rise in temperature and you kind of think well where is this going and it's scary and so whereas there were the kind of committed greenies who had concerns about what was happening to our world and there have been always really ever since I was a teenager the threat that we might suffer from a nuclear exchange or accident, um, there is a much more real and widespread sense that the future we're heading into is um, really um, disturbing. Mm. Yeah. And, and my experience of that is that it's really across the board. There's a lot of resistance to it, so it's interesting that um, in the last 20 years there's actually been an increase in the number of people in North America who say they have no concerns at all about climate change but there's also been an, an increase in the number of people who are very concerned so there's been a polarization um, with that deepening um, that kind of hardening of, of resistance um, but, but I see right across the board people from all walks of life are really getting it that we're, we're, we're in an incredible mess and uh, where do you see uh, the importance of eldership in facilitating um, people to overcome that inner resistance? Yeah, I think that there is a path to follow. I think of it as a, as a wisdom trail that people who have spent a lot of time and attention looking at the question of what helps us respond, um, and I just think particularly of Joanna Macy, who's been doing this work for decades certainly like three and a half decades, the way that she has refined and polished, um, even in the time that I've known working with her, I, I, I just really struck by the degree to which this is well developed through repeated use and reflection and refinement. And so, yeah, there's a real need for time with learning from elders. Mm. And um, to talk a bit about uh, the Centre for Human Ecology that you um, taught a workshop for um, some years ago, um, from the perspective of people um, using transformative education and their social and environmental activism, um, what do you think is the most important uh, role for transformative education in all this? Well, I think also something that I think is also a newer context is economic collapse and it's happening perhaps more acutely, well it is happening more acutely in some European countries than others like Spain and um, Greece and but we are witnessing that happening pretty much across the board, this rolling back of social welfare 
It's happening in so many different countries, the austerity measures and cutbacks. And what that's doing is an, more and more people, greater numbers of people, are losing the kinds of social safety nets that we've had in the past. And also the gap between those who are more comfortably off and less comfortably off, you know, that is, is widening. And, and then I think one of the real challenges is around how we, I think of it as social evolution. Social evolution is, is, is how we evolve in our um, development of communities and relationships in a way where we can well, we can go different ways with economic collapse and crisis. One is this kind of people grab for themselves and fortify their little areas and fight for what remains. And another is we accept that I can't, we can, that the only way that we're really going to get out of this mess is if together we build networks of mutual support. And I see that there's such a need to train people in the skills of supporting social cohesion and collaboration. That, um, that we need, we, we can't rely on the old equation of get a job, earn money, support your family, you know, that kind of thing, because they're just there's a collapse of the formal economic structures. We need to have much more development of, um, that's why I love what's happening with the transition movement, because I see it's one movement that's really taking this on. But also education structures, like the Centre for Human Ecology, can be training people in the skills of transition. And that there's a whole range of skills. I mean, one is the understanding of the problem, but I think much more than that, I think a lot of people know about the seriousness of the problem, but it's like we need to raise the capacity of our ability to respond. And so we need trainings in how to organise, how to work with people, how to understand community dynamics, but also how to find in ourselves our best response, how to find our determination, strengthen our resolve, deal with our own fears, um, and also look at the quality of our own relationships with people, how our ability to work with conflict constructively I see as one of the real edges because we are heading for um, it's not just conflicts internationally but conflicts locally over dwindling resources some people having some people having less and and we are challenged to reinvent ourselves as a social organism mm. and uh, you mentioned before the sort of extreme end of poverty that you've witnessed that brought you to the work. But could you just say, perhaps as one of the last comments, um, where you see, uh, we've, we've got, for example, um, a, a lot of inequality in the, in the UK, uh, where you see the connection between human suffering or violence towards humans and violence towards uh, more than humans or nature. Yes, yes. I think you can see it in a number of different ways. And I think as well as injustice between humans there is also injustice between generations and so for example you know that um, there's a kind of idea that if you were to take the world as a hundred people you probably have at least 15 of those in a state of acute starvation and you know, perhaps most of the resources held by 20 um, but if you were to look rather that the world as a hundred people you were to look at um, those hundred people was each ten people represented one generation so it was like ten generations represented and what's happening is this generation as well as being unequal within itself it's also using up resources that won't be available for future generations and so it's not just other humans starving now it's like we are subjecting we are preparing the ground for mass starvation in the future and that's the Perhaps we don't know if it's going to be children, but certainly grandchildren or great-grandchildren, the people alive today, that's the way things are heading. And I think in terms of the relationship between the human and the non-human world, it's just really getting it that you there's no personal salvation. You can't have one species kind of surviving into the future without the others, that we are part of an interwoven web. And if we want human life to continue, we have to knit ourselves back in. We have to see ourselves as part of something much larger. 
and recognise that there's so many ways that we completely depend on the rest of life. Um, and the thing about the future generations is that if we don't get this now, then it's going to be even worse for the future generations mm. because already we're wiping out um, species, you know, species that the future generations will never get to hear about. We don't know what benefits they might have to them, but also they're part of this larger whole of life that we're part of too. So what I'd say, yes, it's, it's not about kind of either or, it's about in order to survive, we need to recognise that we are part of a larger biological community. Thank you very much. Uh, could I add just a couple of supplementary questions before we, um, before we enter this? Um, as someone who's been facilitating the past few days and holding the group, and as someone who's training for other facilitators, what do you think are the most important skills needed to, to facilitate the work? I would say the most important starting point is to um, is to recognise the need for the work through your own experience. So if you have felt um, kind of the anguish and torment of recognising what's going on in our world and then found in the work that reconnects something that's really useful in helping you face that and be with that, or you've, you've experienced the process as something that has energised you and nourished you, and experienced that sense of plugging back in, plugging back into the larger whole of life, you, then I'd say that that is more important than any very fine skill in facilitation. Because if you get to know the work on the inside, you um, through experiencing it, then you'll see what's necessary, um, and then then I think begins a journey. It's like you've you've got the what you, you've kind of seen what's going on here, and then it's more about understanding how how you do that. So I suppose it, are there well, what other skills? I think it's really good to um, develop your ability to listen to a group and what I mean by listen to a group is, is, is something about a sense of where is a group at and what does it need and that's different from having a pre-planned agenda that you wade in with and say now we need to do this it's like you need to be responsive to where people are at and an ability to um, to change what your plans are based on being open to feedback, um, being responsive to what you're sensing back from people. And, and that doesn't mean that you have to kind of stop and have a little questionnaire every moment along the way. You also need to have a kind of confidence in what you're doing and be able to ride um, in the face of resistance sometimes. But I think it's, it's about being able to work with the group is, is, is the real key. Mm, wonderful, thanks. And final question, um, what would you say is the essence of the work that we connect? Yeah, um, it's a strengthening journey that reinforces your connection with our world. That's what my experience it is. I, each time I go around the journey of this spiral, I feel strengthened and I feel reinforced in my connectedness with the larger life of which we're part. Mm. Great summary. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.